trying to get last second promotion going. Yes, sir. <laughs> Welcome to the to the to the lab. Link in the Zoom. That's our YouTube link. We are live on YouTube right now. We're going. We are live. Going for it. I'm gonna take a picture. Uh, the digit. We are so digital natives. Just so I can promo this one more time. Thanks. This is so fun. Uh, I'm sure that this will probably end up being like a seven hour podcast. <laughs> 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 All right. Do you guys want to officially get started, Mario? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, whenever, whenever you are ready, my friend. You're 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 running point today. So uh, Mo's, oh. Mo, Mo's in the driver's seat. It's where he likes to be. So uh, oh, don't say it like that. <laughs> <laughs> that. That's that's what it is. Let's do it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, everyone that's watching Creatives Worldwide, National, because we know we have an audience for our very special guest that's global right now. Welcome to the Dadpreneur Podcast. So good morning, good evening, good afternoon, all of that. Mario, in one breath, who are you? What do you do? Take a big breath. Uh, my name is Mario. I, I lead a creative agency in Honolulu called Made by Maker. Um, and I'm a creative director, have over two decades of experience designing and doing branding and all that fun stuff. And uh, I like to work out. It's fun stuff. Beautiful. David, one breath. Hit us with who you are, what you do, in case nobody knows. Uh, my name is Dave Coe. I run a little studio here in Vancouver doing motion graphics and some video as well. Uh, and yeah, I'm a dad of twin <laughs> girls and, uh, and a little toddler. <laughs> Let's go. My name is Mo Ismail. I go by Mo Isma on all social channels. I run a creative video marketing agency known as Mox outside of Mississippi. Am I crooked letter, crooked letter, but enough about us today. We have a very, very special guest on the show and I'm not going to introduce because he's <laughs> going to give his introduction because I don't want to butcher it. No. Please welcome Mr. Michael Chanda. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I love this this podcast when you guys uh, launched and I saw your tagline because parent entrepreneur is hard. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I'm so awesome. in on this. So when Mario mentioned to me uh, being on it, I was like, done. Anybody who has a creative tagline like that, I'm so in. <laughs> My name is Michael Janda. I'm super excited to be here. I'm an agency veteran. I built built up an agency over 13 years, sold it. Uh, I've written a couple of books and I spend my time doing business coaching and consulting and, and speaking and some thought leadership and trying to help creatives around the world because I didn't have enough help for me. So I'm, I'm uh, trying to fill a void that I wish I would have had somebody fill when I was in the trenches. Well, welcome. And thank you for being on the show and taking the time. And thank you for all that you do. I, I know you use the word some thought leadership, but you're, you're, you're leading the way for, for getting a lot of people out of, the, uh, out, of their, out of their cocoon and also sharing their thought leadership. So thank you for, for this beautiful tidal wave that we are riding right now. So uh, it's, it's so fun and it, you know, it's so fun to see so many people. And my value back is when somebody sends me a message and says, oh, I, I just greenlit a huge project or I, you know, I asked for more money than I thought I was gonna ask for and they said yes. You know, when I get messages like that, it's the it's a massive payoff, so yeah, it's great. Oh, I was going to mention too. I have three boys uh, since this is the Dadpreneur podcast. You know, three boys, and I have a twenty-one-year-old, an eighteen-year-old, and an eight-year-old, all boys. And my three boys are the fifth generation of all boys. Oh, have, isn't that crazy? Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Nuts. It's the Janda genes, man. We don't know how to make women. <laughs> we, it's. It's only boys. It's wow. testosterone rich in our home. Okay. I love that you said that you have three boys. Walk us through. They're older now. Maybe yeah. walk us through how being 20 years in the game, especially in an agency life and service, customer service world, especially when you're in the service industry creatively, is a tough gig. How have you through the years managed that family and work-life balance? 
It, it's, it's really tough. Uh, so, you know, agency life, when I had a dozen plus employees and I got to where we had 20 employees and, and the agency churn is so stressful that unfortunately, I was always there with my kids physically, but not always there mentally. Um, that's the challenge. And, you know, phones and things have just made it worse for people where you can be present next to your child, but you're distracted by whatever is going on in your business. So it's, that's been a real challenge. You know, I had a lot of vacations where I'm taking phone calls on the beach and I'm, you know, taking phone calls while other people are riding rides at Disneyland and, and I'm working through things. So it's, it's always, it's always been a challenge. I think when my youngest, my two oldest boys were young is when I started my agency. And I would say, you know, we look at, uh, we look at trying to have this work-life balance and things, you know, we want to have this balance, but my kids, I was always there for the soccer games and things. And, and I, you know, I've been a good dad, so I don't fault myself for that. But what I lost in time with them, they gained in perspective because they mm-hmm. think entrepreneurship they think about money differently than than a lot of their friends you know if you ask my kids how much if if x amount of dollars is a lot of money they're probably going to say no because we've been talking about big overhead for a lot of years Uh, my oldest when he was in high school was talking about wanting to buy commercial real estate because i've owned a few spaces and you know I didn't talk about that stuff till I was like 35 years old. And so for him as a teenager to talk about things like that uh, was a big deal to me because they were getting an education through this process of seeing me go through the entrepreneurial journey. And that education has changed their entire paradigm for the world, you know, for, for their careers, for any aspect from financial aspects. Uh, um, so it's just been really paradigm shifting for them. Uh, so we want work life balance and we want to be there, but we can't, you know, flog ourselves for not being there because we are as entrepreneurs giving something else to our children that also has value. So I, I think, you know, it's easy to get hard on ourselves when we have to spend a lot of hours or we get distracted with the phone call while we're at the beach and, we feel bad about it, but there's something good about it too. That's, that's powerful. Gentlemen, thoughts on, thoughts on those gems that he just dropped, particularly the fact that the kids gained perspective. I love hearing it. For me, it's like the other side of the tunnel. Like I'm definitely yeah. still in the tunnel. So to hear like, hey, they gained perspective, the conversations are different. I have a follow-up, but Mario or Dave, do you guys thoughts on that or follow-up questions? I think that's, that's I mean... My kids are still fairly young. My girls are two, uh, twin girls, and uh, my son is four. So I don't know how much they're taking in. Um, but I mean, going forward as they, as they get older, uh, that, that is one of the things that I'm considering is like they're going to be exposed to their, their dad, you know, sort of venturing into the entrepreneurial world and trying different things. And uh, so I'm hoping that that passes on to them. Uh, as much as I want to spend time with them now, and and my wife and I actually took a couple years off to do that, um, but yeah, yeah, that's a I think that's a valuable uh, perspective that that maybe we don't always uh, remember as we're yeah. going through the slogging through the especially the hard times. And like I just want to spend some time with my family. <laughs> yeah, yeah. M- Michael, for those of us that are in the trenches right now. And that maybe it's difficult for us to see the other side. I love how you put it that they gain perspective and there's this paradigm shift that has happened and you've seen that fulfillment on the other side. What tips could you give to current parents that are in the grind? You know, you have the, the opportunity now to take your work with you. And so my, my advice, number one, is if you've got the deadline, you've got whatever going on, there's stress, there's a client email that needs to be written, or you have employees and somebody's having some challenge, you can take it with you. You got your phone, you've got a hot spot on your phone, you can bring your laptop. So be there. If you can't be there mentally, at least be there physically. And you go back, you know, 20 years ago before connectivity was the way it is now, 
you had to be at the office to handle everything. And now you, you, can, you can be completely mobile. So I'm a big uh, fan of always being present, you know. And I, I'd say, too, make some things non-negotiable. Things like, you know, family dinner. That from six to seven, no matter what's going on, you're going to be home for family dinner. Make it a priority so that your kids have that consistency. And then if you've got to, you know, put them to bed and then go back to work, well, they don't know the difference anyway. So I think that there's, there's something like that. When I was growing my, from freelance to agency, man, it was 80 hour weeks. I was just buried and I had to start hiring people. And I was afraid to hire people because I wasn't an entrepreneur at that time. I was just a designer, an overgrown freelancer with too much work. So I had to figure out the rest, but I can't count the number of times I'd come up from my basement office, have dinner with my family, and then go back down into the office and work until midnight or one in the morning. Mm. So ah. it's, it's, it's part of the, you pay a price for it, but I think there's, you know, like I said at the start of this question, you can bring it with you and at least be there so your kids know you're there uh, if you can't completely be there mentally. Mm. I'm just this is all here. the stuff. This is all the stuff I tell myself to make myself feel better <laughs> about having spent a lot of hours uh, working over the last twenty years. So, but you I'm, know what the payoff is? Let me tell you this, and I, I know I get talkative, but I have an eight-year-old now, and man, I drive him to school half the mornings of the week. He's, I'll take you know, I'll stop at three o'clock in the afternoon. He has a different dad than my older two boys did because. They were there during the mega entrepreneurial years and I'm entrepreneurial now, but I'm doing it from a place of, of uh, wisdom and experience instead of the fear of trying to solve it. And it's a whole different game. Uh, but my eight year old, he, he has a, a definitely a, a very involved dad compared to my older two boys for sure. Are your, uh, are your older, your older boys a little bit more jealous because of that? Well, yeah. I mean, is there's, a, a, is there some gap? Pushback? there's yeah. a 10 year gap between oh, right. the middle and then the youngest. So, there, you know, the, for the middle child, uh, the youngest stole his uh, baby of the home uh, <laughs> position. <laughs> so I, I don't know, man, I'm not a psychologist, but there's definitely some psychology that somebody could dissect going on there for sure. <laughs> The, the kids just trying to one up each other like yeah. yeah you had you had entrepreneur janda that's why you're gonna be able to buy real estate but i had drive yeah. me to school janda and yeah i, guess, exactly. I get more deep conversations <laughs> 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 haha there's there's not too many deep conversations with an eight-year-old but uh, <laughs> i am watching harry potter with him for the first time in my life so i've never watched him i'm like one of the the minority of the world uh so he, he's a uh, and I'm old enough where half of it, I'm like kind of replying to DMs on Instagram and the other half I'm watching it. So half the time, I'm, I don't even know what's going on in Harry Potter, in Harry Potter land. You but look up and there's some random ghoul and you're like, what is happening in yeah. this film? Yeah. Okay. You said something that I think is so powerful and I appreciate your vulnerability so much because some people are not willing to say these things. And that is, you talked about how in the early stages of your business life, you were, um, uh, an, I don't know how you said it exactly, but over glorified freelancer. You were just a designer, not an entrepreneur. You were scared to hire people. I think yeah. a lot of times why it's difficult for parents to have that uh, harmony in parenting and business is that they can't find the time. So how can somebody make that shift from creative or designer to an entrepreneur to be able to buy back their time? What would you suggest? Uh, it's, it's a tough switch because you have to change a lot of paradigms. You have to start letting go of the tasks that have to happen in your business. You have to start letting go of the fact that something may take you 30 minutes and it may take somebody else that you delegate it to four hours to do the same thing, but you have to delegate it anyway. This is a, this is a big challenge for a lot of people because they'll say, oh, why should I hire somebody? when they're going to spend eight hours doing something that takes me one hour, but you can't ever grow if you don't start letting go of that kind of stuff. 
And then you have a job to train that person up to get it to where it would take them eight hours to do your one hour of work. But you, you train them up to where it's four hours to your one hour of work. You're, as an entrepreneur, and this is the way I look at hiring, you're buying back morsels of your time. So you hire somebody in, in a 40-hour week. They can do what you could do in one day. But by hiring them for one week, you buy back a day of your life. And you have to kind of look at it that way. It's, it's one of the shifts that you have to make as an entrepreneur. Uh, the other thing, too, that was a big shift for me was, and I've shared this a number of times, but I started looking at money in three-month increments instead of annual increments. So when I mm. first started hiring my first couple employees, I thought, oh, man, I'm hiring this person and they're costing me 30 grand a year. And that felt like a huge amount of money to me at the time. And I had, I, I looked, I was looking at it wrong because I had to look at it in three month increments. So a $30,000 a year employee isn't costing you $30,000. They're only costing you what? $2,500 a month. They're costing you like $7,500 in the next three months. And when you, when you kind of distill down the numbers a little bit, I looked at that and thought, okay, that, that I can handle 7,500 bucks. I got 7,500 bucks in my business account right now. I'll spend it on this person. And then in 90 days, I'm going to assume that they're making a big difference or they're not. And if they're not, then I'm going to go back to being just me. Or if they're making a big difference, then I'm probably billing more money than what I was before. So I, I've gone through a lot of these mental paradigm shifts over the years of where I've had to start really looking at things with a different lens. And I think that that's the big trick in going from being a designer to an entrepreneur is you've got to really flip your perspective on how you're viewing your business, on how you're viewing employing people, on how you're viewing delegating tasks, on how you're viewing systems and processes. There's just so many things. On how you view money, there's so many things that you have to, you have to change your paradigm and it took me a long time to figure out, figure out those things. Go, oh, Mario, look like you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You look like you're ready to. I'm like, I'm like where's, like, my, where's my crystal where's light? Where's my hot key? Where's it go? Um, so with all that, Mike, um, you know, I think we've talked about a little bit about it you know, in a couple of our talks, but how thinking about your business in that way, how has that impacted how you've kind of co-run your family has that how how is how is that affected like you know I, obviously you're not hiring children or, or whatever to do you know to be your child but you're yeah. training them up, but but i mean the training yeah. process the training process is the same right like training yeah. them up and and kind of like mentoring your kids and discipling them in, into a specific role or way like how has all of that business acumen kind of translated into the home okay so if if i wasn't married to my wife jody my home would be like the military. That's, <laughs> that's how it would be. It would be so, it would be like so regimented, you know, I'm a systems operations guy. That's, that's how my mind works. And so I would, I would be just like, you know, when you're finished with dinner, you, you would rinse your plate and you stick it in the dishwasher and there would be no mistakes with this, you know, <laughs> because I would have been like, but my wife, Thank goodness we have yin yang in the world because my wife uh, is definitely a good balance for me on that where she's not so uber systematic like that. So that would be number one that I would say. And then number two, how it has changed. Uh, okay, repeat, repeat, the, repeat your question on that, Mario. I think um, basically what I was saying is how has um, your your education as a business owner and um, business leader affected your home. Okay. Yeah. Life. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, here's how I look at everything. This, this started at my agency. Uh, when I started writing the book, burn your portfolio, I started writing it thinking, okay, I'm going to make this employee manual. It started as an employee manual and it grew from there. And when I started writing it, I started looking at every experience that happened to me in my life and in my business. I would look at it and say, what's the lesson here? What am I supposed to learn from this? The good things and the bad things. We have a massive success 
I look at that and say, what do I have to do to replicate that? We have a massive failure. I look at it and say, what, what system broke down that made us fail on this project or with this client? And that perspective has changed, probably uh, changed the way that I parent as well, because I'm always looking at that for my kids and especially my older boys now that are old enough to understand these lessons. I look at things with them and I think, you know, I, I try and teach the lesson that, we lo- that we're supposed to learn from this experience right here. It's all about being open and with your children. I've also hired my kids too to manage our, our commercial space. And, you know, they're massively overpaid for the work that they do. But, you know, when they're 16 years old or 15 years old and they're having to go and collect a rent check, and log into the bank account and make sure that the insurance was auto deducted and write the HOA check or the, the property management check. And they're going down and doing those things. I could do those things and not pay them any money because it really only takes 15 minutes. But I look at it as an opportunity for my kids to get a taste of other things. And now my 18 year old, he's old enough when he goes and picks up the rent check, he's like, man, this is a lot of money. I got to get, get a building like this. You know, that's his perspective, but it's all about trying to teach him these principles to help them see things differently. So I guess that's a long winded answer to say, I always look for what is the lesson here and then make sure that we talk about that with these, with my boys so that they are connecting the dots that these things, these experiences we go through in life aren't just to make us have a crappy day. There, I believe that we go through experiences and challenges and things in life to help us improve and grow over time. And if we experience those things with that perspective, then, you know, at some point in our lives, we become the 80 year old grandpa of the wise grandpa who has all the answers. And the grandkids come and they, you know, they're 20 years old and they're asking grandpa for his wisdom. And, and we're never going to gain that if we don't go through life trying to connect the dots between the experience and the lesson that we're supposed to learn. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> our buddy, yeah. uh, our buddy Bob Bonials uh, says he, he doesn't know if he could trust <laughs> that kind of thing to his 15 year old son's mind and attention span. <laughs> yeah. He, you know, it, it isn't without challenges for sure. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to think of like when my son's 15 would I let him pay the rent for my office and I'm like uh, debatable right now but I I definitely like the the notion of it helps them think through what can they learn from this moment and how yeah. how can they fail and then apply it in their own like respective life whether professionally or personally yeah. I do have a I do have a follow up even though the comments are starting to go a little bananas so that's good we've got yeah. some momentum you said you're a systems guy so there's a framework for how things get done. I'm sure when it's just the boys at the house, there's a system for whether it's fun oh, or, or, <laughs> or work, work or play. How, yeah. how has having systems in your professional life changed your business for the better? Because I think a lot of us, especially in the solopreneur stage, get caught up in, in just doing and never yeah. take a second to reflect and breaking things down so it can be repeatable for the next person. So how have yeah. systems helped you build a better business? It was, tran- it was transformative. It was everything. Uh, I read about two years into freelancing, I read the book, The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. I shout it out a lot. If nobody, if you have not read it and you're a freelancer or a small agency or a big agency, it's a must read. Uh, and Michael Gerber in that book says systems run the business, people run the systems. And I thought, oh man, that makes a lot of sense to me. So in order, and and your job as an entrepreneur is to replicate yourself with the people that work at your business. So the only way to replicate yourself is to create a checklist-based system to uh, help others follow exactly the process that you do the work, how you do the work. The greatest example of this is McDonald's where they can hire the lowest quality employee ever, the people, their first job ever, they're not qualified sometimes for other things and they can go to McDonald's and make a Big Mac in the very first day. They don't have to be a chef because the systems are so regimented there that you can put it all together. Um, We need to do the same thing 
in our businesses. We, we should look at it with the mindset that my objective is to replicate myself so that I can be the entrepreneur and not the guy doing everything. Mm. Entrepreneur's job is to create a vision for the business and to drive the, the business forward. And the technicians are the ones who are pushing all the pixels and doing all the work. That's the perspective you have to do. And a lot of freelancers who are solo freelancers, they're the technicians so deeply that they can never get any entrepreneurial time. They never, they never even take the time to sit in the coffee shop and start ideating goals for their business. They're just, their goal is I need to green light another project tomorrow. They're not thinking past any window past that. And so systems is the way to get yourself out of the hamster wheel of just crank and work and get yourself some entrepreneurial time. So your objective is create systems, hire people to run those systems and start freeing up your time to do bigger picture things for your business. Whew. The chat is going crazy. Bob said, replicating yourself, so critical. You have to make the map and detail the system to plug people in. Yes. It's powerful. 100%. It's, it's the way it's done. Uh, you know, the e-myth, that, that is the must read because there's not a better articulation of that idea than, than what's in that book. And do you think you do that at home or do you, or do you try to cultivate independence in your kids? Uh, you know, I'm hands off now because my wife... But like I said, you know, my, there's a balance. You know, when I married, when I, when I got engaged to my wife, my mom said to me, she said, oh, that's, that's great. She'll make it so that you have fun. That's what she said. And I was like, what? <laughs> mom, I, I'm so fun. <laughs> you do not know me, mom. This is how I felt. But my mom was right. My wife is definitely, you know, a lot more fun of a person. At least she was. I think that I've made her too serious over the years. Uh, but she, she's definitely a good balance on that. I have gotten old enough where I'm tired of parenting. So there's a lot more, <laughs> there's a lot more, eh, you're not going to die. If you're not going to die, I'm not going to get involved. So there, there is a measure of that going on. That's, uh, that's the bar now. Like if it's not death, um, kind of hands off at this point, you, you know, know? even death, even death at some point, like, <laughs> Well, there's well, a pretty decent chance that he's not going to die when he leaves the house. So I'm okay. Oh man, I think I, I think I reached that when my son was born. I was like, ah, you're fine. <laughs> you were Just, there. I was already <laughs> there. I was. Well, I, think it's my, I think it's my age. Yeah, I think it's yeah. my age. But I was like, you know, I was. We were super careful with my daughter, but my son, yeah. he's just like this little this little mini bowl, and I'm like, you'll be fine. You can bounce. You're fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can <laughs> bounce. <laughs> It was a Paul Reiser. I think it's Paul Reiser in the book Parenthood. He's like, you know, your first child, you say, oh, you chase him around. You're like, oh, I got to keep him from dying and, and things. And then by your second and third kid, you're like, oh, you couldn't kill one of these things if you, if you were trying. They're like <laughs> indestructible. So that's, the, that's the mindset shift between, you know, the first child and the second and third child. Spoken like a true entrepreneur. <laughs> who's like, I'm going to let my employees fail so we can have a, a meeting and say, what did you do wrong here? It's like, even if I tried to kill my children, they will not die. <laughs> Everything's a teaching point. Everything's a teaching moment. Yeah, there's a lot of teaching moments, but I wasn't that way as much with my business, man. I do, I do have a perspective that a business, there's a chapter in my book, Bring Your Portfolio, that's called uh, Business is an Entity That Wants to Die. And, and there's a lot of truth in this mindset that if you're not, like your business is a lemming that's just trying to walk off the cliff all the time. And you as the business owner is just like trying to shepherd it back onto the cliff so it doesn't die because there's so many external forces that are trying to kill your business. The clients aren't spending. There's a bad client. The employees aren't doing their job. There's financial challenges. The client's not paying. There's all kinds of things that are going on. And your job is just like CPR every day to keep this entity alive. And that's how I felt after, you know, and it's kind of a negative perspective, I suppose, but I think there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, I was talking with somebody the other day and they were like, yeah, if you don't feed, if you don't feed the machine, it's going to die. And so you're always constantly feeding this entity because it's trying to die on you. 
it's like CPR all day long on, on a business. I wanted to go back to um, when we're talking about the family dynamics, like it was there, is there, or was there an agreement that you came to with your wife in terms of roles and, uh, you know, parenting and business and was she working before you had kids like, and how did that work out? Yeah, she was working before we had kids. We were married a couple of years before we had kids. And, um, and so she was doing, she was school teacher and stuff. And, um, we never really came to a, like a formal agreement on whose role was what we, it was kind of organic. Once I started being in business and, uh, you know, being the entrepreneur, my wife by default started to handle most other things in our lives because I was handling so much in the business. One nice thing that happened when I started hiring employees and I hired my first office manager I go with the mindset that you you shouldn't do anything that you you can pay somebody minimum wage to do. I've uh, mentioned this before too. So I started looking at all the things I was doing that I could pay minimum wage to do. And I, you know, I go to mailbox, and this is the nice thing about being a, a sole owner of a business. I go to my personal mailbox, and I just get the mail out. And then I go into the office, and I put it on the desk of my office manager, and she'd pay all my bills and fill out whatever paperwork needed to be filled out. I mean, it was just all personal stuff, but it was all stuff that I needed to have done so that I could focus on doing other things. And so if you own the business outright, there's no problem in doing that. If you have business partners and stuff, then it gets a little clunky on, on how that's being handled. But um, that was, that was kind of the way that, that we handled it. And so doing that, it made it different for my wife than what a lot of uh, people who have a spouse at home who's managing the home, that person's, you know, usually managing a whole lot of uh, administrative things for the home. And we kind of dumped that on our office managers who I had, I was fortunate to have just awesome. I had two different office managers over my uh, 13 year stint and they were both incredible. Like one of them, when she left the company after I sold, uh, I didn't even change my bank passwords. Shout out to her. She could probably log in right now and, you know, embezzle all my money. But I trust her so much that I know that she wouldn't do that. But now that I'm saying this on live YouTube, I'm probably going to change my passwords this afternoon. So. <laughs> Persist to deplete a bank account. <laughs> yeah. More Janda is no more. Yeah. No more Janda. It's all gone. Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, I do. I do have a question based on the comments. I'm a, this is going to require the coaching cap. So this is this is like coaching agenda. We have Bob, and he said, "I have the challenge of being a husband to my wife and a business partner." So we know Bob. Bob's uh, business partner is his wife. So yeah. um, let's take it away from Bob and just from the lens of people that do have business partners. Um how can they manage that for the best outcome of their business? And maybe you can tie it in to the best management for their home as mm. well. What do you think? Okay, well, that second one might be tough, but the, the, first <laughs> one I can give you, the first one I can give you some advice on. The, when, I, when I work with people who ha are in a partnership, the, one of the first things I ask them is if they've documented their roles. And almost always they have never done this so my recommendation is sit in a in a room with a dry erase or you and your business partner and you start identifying all of the responsibilities of this business and put it into two columns who's responsible for this and who's responsible for this it doesn't make any sense to have a business partner if you feel the weight of the entire list and this is what a lot of business partners do. And they, they get frustrated that their business partner isn't doing something. And their business partner's frustrated that they're not doing that because they both own the list emotionally, but neither of them own the tasks of the list. And so they get into this weird dynamic where it's not documented and identified. And then anything else that comes up in their business as they go through when there's something new that shows up, you put it, you go back to that board, you go back to that list and you say, okay, we've got this new entity that we need to, to manage in our business. Who's going to own this? 
and uh, so that's the that's the first step: clear delineation of responsibility, and make it documented so that both of the partners, or all three, or all four partners, or whoever, have it cl a clear understanding of who's responsible for what. Now, how do we take this idea and incorporate it into a home? You know. I, I could sit down with my wife and say, let's, let's draw a piece of paper with, and cut it in half. Who's responsible for what? That conversation's not going to go so well for me. So, you know, it's, <laughs> so I don't even have it. I, I don't even have that conversation. But there is a challenge for Bob that his spouse is the business partner. Man, I think even more so you've got to look at it as, okay, who's responsible for which piece of this? And I've seen it work. One of my best friends is in a business like that. He and his wife, and they're so complete opposites that she handles so many things amazingly well that he would fail at. And he's super creative and can handle a lot of things that she's not uh, skilled for. So that balance is really good. And that's why I think when it works the best, when, when we're, you know, we mentioned yin yang at the start, but it's, it's when, you know, X person fills all the gaps of Y person. It's like any relationship that, that usually can be an effective relationship. Yeah, my, uh, <clears throat> my brother and sister-in-law are partners in their startup and it's very symbiotic. Like they are like they, my brother is all back of the house. He doesn't want to be in the front. And my, my sister-in-law is a former model. She loves speaking. She loves being out front. So there's like this really nice, uh, partnership between their personalities so now that and yeah. in the in the business type stuff like they're you know they have very defined and specific roles too so um it their their personalities work well for working together but i know a lot of people that it does not work well at all yeah it's a challenge man uh, business partnership in general is it's it's rare to have it work well most of the times it it doesn't i i wonder what the the failure rate on partnerships are versus sole owner you know we we know things like divorce rates in different in different places i wonder what the business partnership failure rate is i bet you it's higher than a divorce rate because Yikes. you don't because you don't love each other right <laughs> All, mm -hmm. business partners love each other at the start and when the crap's hitting the fan they typically don't love each other so much so it's a challenge that's Man, that got dark for a second there. I just kind of like, oh, it just got really real. It's like, hey, if you have a partner, the shit out of luck. Sorry. It's like. <laughs> I usually try to be positive and uplifting. So that was a little negative. What is, what is the divorce rate and how high does it correlate to partnership dropouts? It's like, oh, God, how did we get down this rabbit hole? Next but on Dadpreneur. <laughs> Next on Dadpreneur. <laughs> This Speaking of mom for your uh, <laughs> yeah. yikes, tread tread carefully, gentlemen. Tread carefully. No, but speaking of speaking of darkness, what has but to get into the light? What has gotten you through some dark times? Like what what do you usually fall back on um, when whether it's family or business or both? Yeah, usually. Um, well, I've had I've had dark times in both for sure. Um, I just did a post uh, the other day out of Conquer Freelance Worry and every all like eight of those mantras in there are the mantras that got me through all my dark times in my whole life. You know, number one was like, you're not going to die. I had to, I, I've been, it's been some dark moments where you're sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, this is the end for me. I'm not going to survive this. And that's not true. You're not going to die. The other biggest fear that emerged several times, because when you have overhead and business churn and big contracts, the fear is, oh crap, I'm going to lose everything. I've been cranking on this business for a decade and now it's all hanging in the balance because X client is, is a terrible client. I should never have done this deal. And you feel like everything's hanging in the balance. And I felt that a few times during, during my agency run. And the fact is, is you're not going to lose everything. The likelihood of anybody losing everything is so minuscule. The other one I think that emerges is that you get a bad client experience and then you think in your head, oh, I'm never, I'm never going to get another client again because so-and-so is bad mouthing me all over town. How am I ever going to green light another project? And that's one of the little nuggets in that post too, is that, so-and-so client does not have the relationship power to destroy your business. 
And anybody who does have the relationship power to destroy your business doesn't go around destroying businesses. You know, it's the Elon Musk. Yeah, he could, he could uh, bash a business and destroy a business or Gary Vaynerchuk has millions of people, but even he probably couldn't destroy somebody's business by bad mouthing a business. But the people at that level with that kind of influence, they don't go doing that. They're not doing that. So, you know, we get, we get caught up into these dark moments when we think it's all done. I'm going to lose everything. This client's going to destroy my business. I might, I might even die. I might have a heart attack because this is so emotionally tense to me. Uh, and none of, it's, none of that's true. The fact is you're going to come out the other side better than you are today. Every experience you go through is an opportunity to learn and grow and get more calloused and capable. And you're going to look back on whatever trauma you're going through right now. You're going to look back on it five years from now and you're going to say, man, that, that turned me into the dadpreneur that I am today. You know, that's what, that's what, that's what you're going to say. If you go through it right, if you go through it with the right perspective, that's what you're going to say. And every one of those challenging experiences that I've been through has made me a better person today. So I'm grateful for them. I hate going through them but I'm grateful for the experience of it. Guys, I love his perspective, yo. It's like so grounded. It's rock solid. Like the fortress is deep. So I want to go back to the fact that you have systems and I know you've been in the game for, and I admire that so much to be able to go through those events and and, and those things and to come out on top. Careful, Mo. He's but, a little sensitive about how old he is. So. Yeah. No, I said you've been in the game, bro. Come on. <laughs> what? Been, that's why I don't grow out my beard, man. You're so courageous to have this gray beard coming. It looks good on you, but. I know. It's, uh, it's just, again, laziness right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's that dadpreneur beard. That's what that is, you know? What systems have you put in place to be able to establish such a rock solid perspective that you, th- that you can drop on us for other people to replicate? Aside from Um, these mantras. Okay. So I think one of the systems that I have is I used, I used Evernote forever and I use Notion now. And one of the things that I do is when I'm going through one of these challenging things, I write it down and write down how I'm going to solve this. What what is the solution to this? And I'll give you a a big one. There was the recession. My, My agency went through the recession. In like 2008, we billed 1.5 million or something. And in 2009, we billed 700 grand. And so it was just a massive cut to, you know, half your billings gone. And when I went through that and I was just trying to eke my way through 2009, I sat down once with, I'm not a journal writer, but I had a journal notebook and I was like, you know what? I had to write down everything that I'm learning here because if I don't write it down, then it may never end. Cause I believe that we're, we go through these experiences to learn lessons. So my thought was I'm going to, I'm going to write down all the lessons I learned in this notebook. So hopefully I can trick the universe into stopping this trauma for me. And I think that that's, that's probably the biggest system that could apply to anybody listening to this, that, to get yourself grounded, write it down. What, what's the experience? What are you learning from it? And what are you going to change so you don't do it in the future? And then poof, there's a system. And a lot of the content that I share on my Instagram channel and in videos and things like this, it's directly from those kinds of experiences. It's from sitting there saying, crap, client is screwing me out of $200,000 what am I going to do? What, what am I going to learn from this? You know? And so you start writing down the, the lessons so that they hopefully don't happen again. We don't want to learn the same thing over again. And the easiest way to learn something is to learn it from somebody who's already been through it. So read books, listen to podcasts, that kind of thing. Learn from other people's experiences. That's the easiest way. The next thing is to learn it the first time through your own experience. But if you're having to have the same experience like five times, and, you, and over and over again, then you're, you're probably not learning the lesson that you're supposed to learn from it the first time. So I'm a big fan of trying to learn the lesson the first time to inhibit it from happening again in the future. 
Powerful. One of those podcasts that you can listen to and learn from is called the Dadpreneur Podcast because Parentrepreneur is too difficult to say. And oh. uh, mo- and Instagram.com slash more Janda. Uh, shameless plugs there for the yes. for the current video feed. That's uh, uh, that's that's is awesome. That's uh, <laughs> that's one of his more jandas. How many how many do you have now, Mike? Oh, you yeah. got like fifty five more jandas. You know that's been I do. There's like <laughs> five or six different language more jandas, and that's just been I didn't ever do any of them. I've just re- received requests from the community saying, "Hey, we want to make one and we want to translate it," and I was like all right, my, my goal is to distribute knowledge. So if people want to start distributing knowledge into other languages, then I'm all for that. And it's, that's been something really gratifying and rewarding. Oh, Dave's cooking something up. Go ahead, Dave. I heard you. <laughs> no, I was going to ask, like just seeing sort of tracing back uh, the history of, of your experience, um, you know, as a designer and then as, you know, going freelance and then, eventually starting an agency and now consulting, what was the sort of, was there a, a turning point, a, a milestone, a, a, a critical event that pushed you towards consulting from, you know, the agency world or was it just, you were tired of it? And- yeah. All of those <laughs> things. You, you, you can only survive in agency grind so long. I mean, no, nobody survives and, and that's one, like, it'll eventually kill you. I said you're not going to die. But yes, if you own an agency for more than probably 25 years, there's, you, you could probably die from that. It's so, the grind is intense. Uh, the, so, the catalyst, I had a couple experiences. So, number one, when my first book was published, I started to catch a vision thinking, oh, man, there's maybe something here. I loved writing that. I love going and doing speaking engagements and things. I loved that giving back and that mentoring kind of life. I loved that. And so I, that just sat in a bug in my ear. And that was 2013. I didn't sell until 2015. And I stayed at the agency I sold to until 2018, until the early last year. And so I had a run where I didn't do anything with that. I had this kind of thought that maybe someday I can do something with that. So it was always there as, as a little bit of a bucket list uh, plan. The big catalyst was... Um, there are a couple. One, I, we moved into a new office space in 2012, and it was my dream office space. I bought a building shell. We designed the space, and it was the space I always dreamed of, glass walls and chalkboard wall and whiteboard room and ping pong table and all the stuff. You know, it was the, the pictures I had looked at for a decade. Now we were in the space, and it was super exciting. So that was like I'm on a summit here. I've accomplished everything my vision had for this. And once you feel like you kind of are on, uh, have achieved it, then the, the hike isn't so exciting anymore. If you've put the flag in the summit, then, I mean, nobody even wants to walk down the mountain. You're, you're enthusiastic to go up to, to, to conquer the mountain but then you sit up there and you eat a sandwich and you just wait and try and recoup your energy and you hope somebody can come pick you up because you accomplished the thing that you want. And so I think that there was a measure of that that happened to me as well, where you're just, you know, ready for something new. Yeah. For those listening, put it into perspective. When did you shift from agency work to consulting? Cause, uh, I'm not downing anyone that's trying to go straight into consulting, but I love when I love when people like yourself come on and ground us. Repeat one more time for me. Like when, <laughs> when was the so cutoff? I started 2002. I started my agency and then I grew it to 2015. And then I stayed at the agency I worked that I sold to until 2018. So there was a 15 years of agency grind. Um, in that course of time, we build $30 million of, of business. We had tons of employees. It was just that whole churn. Uh, and, and that, man, even the last couple of years after I sold, I learned so much because now I had, I was a minority owner of the agency I sold to and I had business partners for the first time. So I learned a lot about business partner relationships and things and delegating, you know, whose responsibilities are what in the agency and things. And So there were a lot of things that I learned from that and systems and processes. They did a ton of strategy work. They still do. And they were really great at it. And my agency 
didn't do nearly as much strategy work as them. So I learned a lot about the strategy side of the creative industry in those last couple of years, but it was a 15 year run. Uh, and now being a consultant, I can sit down with nearly any type of business because I've in my agency, we did work for every type of business over the years. So I've consulted businesses from lawn care companies to Google mm. on on what they need to do. So I've been in those chairs. And then from a, a design standpoint, if you're running a freelance agency or, or, uh, or grown, a, grown an agency, I've been in those shoes, the, almost the full gamut of those shoes. And so uh, you can't just decide when you have a year of experience that you want to start doing consulting because you don't have enough time in the trenches of asking the right questions and and being through all these experiences to be able to solve the problems for the people that you're consulting with. Now, I'm not saying that it can't be done because some people are just ravenous book readers and podcast consumers, and you can learn an amazing amount of, of information that can make you super valuable from a consultation standpoint. But typically it takes a little bit of time to serve in the trenches to, to have something to offer there. Yeah, I definitely have the confirmation bias of like on the job experience has a different ring to it from a, from a consultant that's actually had the on the job experience. Like I, I look at some people's answers online versus other people's answers. I'm like, this guy, like not this guy's in you, but like the people yeah. that have had the experience, like these people have, have been through it. Like you can hear the, 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 the depth in the answer, but, um, Okay, Mario, I, I think we're like close to time, huh? I want to be respectful of the time here. We're like, it's, we've just been rolling. You're muted, bud. <laughs> oh, Mario, <laughs> was muted. What, a, what a noob. What a scrub. <laughs> I'm like trying He's to manage. I'm, haircut though, man, I'm so. trying to manage like three different windows. Um, yeah, I, I, Mike, we, we want to be really respectful of your time. We thank you so much for, for coming by, but um, I can't believe that we've kind of burn through the last hour. I know. Like, I, know. I, I told you when we started, it was going to be seven hours. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're ready to go all night because we're, we're here. Bring some snacks and some ginger I'm ale. <laughs> Canada Dry sponsored uh, Dadpreneur podcast. <laughs> hey, there you go. I've got my uh, vintage American uh, super big gulp. Going right here. <laughs> this, oh, for those of you that wow. think that America is a stereotype of people walking around with gigantic <laughs> sodas, there, right. is, there is truth to the stereotype. I can assure you that's the only cup sold in Mississippi. So uh, there's, <laughs> there's no, no disrespect. I'm just, I'm just speaking facts here. Okay. Michael, tell us our uh, send offs, maybe something we didn't ask that you think would be beneficial in for this podcast or in general for the type of audience that we have. Uh, you know, for me, family is everything. So for this podcast, it's dadpreneur podcast. Man, if you're, if you're an entrepreneur and a dad, you have an opportunity to shape the life of your children in a way that, you know, people going to a nine to five job don't. And so don't hide from your children what you're going through. Don't hide from them the deals that are going south and the, you know, obviously gauge based on their maturity level and age and things, but don't hide from them what you do. Let them inside, let them see inside your life because you have the opportunity to transform they, the way that they think about business for the rest of their life. And uh, the, I believe in the idea of a money blueprint in the book, um, the Secrets of the Millionaire Mind, which is an awesome book. And he talks about a money blueprint. And, you know, some people are programmed to think that money, that $10,000 is a lot of money. And other people think that $10,000 is near bankruptcy. But $10,000 is the same amount for both of those people. One just has a blueprint set to here. And the other one has a blueprint set to here. And I think as an entrepreneurial dad, we have an opportunity to help our children understand business principles, change their money blueprint, change their perspective on side hustles and nine to five jobs and all the things that can make a great career for them 
uh, so don't hide what you're doing from, from your children, from your family and let them, let them see inside. I think that's kind of my send off thinking. There that you go. Was, that was, that couldn't have even crafted a better question to, <laughs> to get him to say that. That was fantastic. That was fantastic. That was fantastic. All right. Well, Mario, I guess, I guess I'm going to sign us off. Michael, thank you so much for taking the time on, man. Thank to you. be here. Thank well, Yeah. One last thing though, Mike, oh, um, if you, um, I know you mentioned your, your book a couple of times and we want to link that, uh, below mm. for everybody, but if you have any other, um, like plugs, we want you to plug all your everything. I know it'll probably take another 15 minutes for all your Instagram <laughs> handles alone, but yeah. we'd love for you to plug all your stuff. Please do that. So my plug is, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to help creatives. And so I'm not, I look at any plugging of any of stuff that is paid from me as a byproduct, not my objective. So follow me on Instagram. I post six times a week, tons of free content. If you DM me, I'm going to DM you back. I don't go to bed with any unread DMs and unresponded DMs. It takes me a ton of time, but I love my association with the creative community and I'm, I'm truly trying to give back to an industry that's been good to me. And that is short on mentors, you know, short on people who are really trying to, to make a difference. And I know we, we are those people and there are a lot of, of us in this Instagram community that are doing an amazing job, but, when you take that relative to the millions of designers in the world, it's just a, a micro quantity compared to the people that we need to be able to help all the people in the trenches. So anyway, so yeah, at more Janda on all channels and you can check out my site, michaeljanda.com. There you awesome. go. Beautiful. Thank you again for being here. Thank you. Of course, for being a colleague, a friend and a mentor, I continue to learn from you and it has been humbling to be here with you (laughs) and he's he's he sets the bar very high watch what he does not just what he shares he's it's that's this is the game right here study game and that'll be that's it for dadpreneur episode we'll see you in the next one right with uh well i mean you'll see me so (laughs) All right, ladies and gentlemen.